As Grant just said, it is so good to be in a full room and probably another fullish room in an hour, so I don't know what's going to happen next week. Um, come early, 9.30. Uh, it, but it is just, I am not taking this moment for granted this Easter. I've al- I always love Easter morning, but uh, like, like Grant just said, it was empty. It was looking at a ladder last year. And this is one of God's great gifts. And I hope you feel that right now, that to meet with the people of God, to sing out his truth is such a good gift. And I just, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for our musicians leading us. I'm thankful for Jordan back here. You were like doing CrossFit wherever, wherever you are, uh, just going crazy. Um, it, it, is, it is really, really good. And so my heart right now is, is thankful as we open God's Word together. I, I invite you to open in your Bible to the book of 2 Timothy. You can find that on page 955 in the Blue Pew Bible, or there's a Bible on the CCC app. You can go there, 2 Timothy. There are a lot of things in life that are nice in theory, but not quite as great in reality when things really get real. For instance, puppies. Puppies are great in theory. They're cute. They're adorable. Who doesn't love puppies, right? Everybody loves a cute little cuddly puppy. And a lot of people at this church in this past year became puppy owners. But the reality of owning a puppy, I think if you took one of these new puppy owners in a dark alley away from kids or spouse and you just asked them, how's it really going? The reality is not quite that great, right? They chew up your Amazon deliveries, they make messes in the house, the vet bills come, they take a lot of work, they wake you up in the middle of the night. Now I know it seems like I am a puppy hater, and I'm not at all. I love other people's puppies. I love to (laughs) play with them. But the reality of owning one is not quite that great. Another example from my life is football. So I grew up in a a sports home. We, we played sports, loved sports, watched sports, just w- what our family did. And I really, really look forward to the day, freshman year, when I would put on the pads for the normal community Ironman. This was a great like, moment of expectation. So the way it works, or it used to work, I don't know how it is now, is you would have a week or two of practice with no pads, and you do all the plays, and it was going great, and I was loving it. And then there's a big day where they say, okay, this is the first day of, of tackle. And I remember this vividly. I was so excited for my first day of taco football until it got real, and it was awful. I remember the the drill we did. The coach put out four cones, kind of making three different alleys, and basically he put one tackler in each little alleyway, and you had the ball, and you had to pick which one you were going to run through, and what happens is is Darwinism, (laughs) It's the survival of the fittest. The winner stays. And by the end, I remember the guys who were there. Kyrie Sykes, Jeff Purcell, and Dante Grismore. And the Grizz means biz, is what he like, likes to say. Right? And I remember, by the way, I was a late bloomer, so I was about 115 pounds. <laughs> and I remember running through this, and literally, this might be too much information, but literally, snot got knocked out of my nose all over to my face mask. And I went home. And I don't know if mom and dad remember this, but I I remember sitting at my kitchen table and crying my first day of tackle football. It was awful. And they made me stick with it. I don't know if that's good parenting or bad, but I ended up uh, liking it and turned out to be okay once I hit a little growth spurt later in life. The idea of things is often really, really nice. The reality is much harder. The idea of Easter is great. On a 73-degree morning when the grass is green, there's not even wind this morning, right? Like, it is great to be here with the people of God singing about resurrection hope. But the reality of having hope in a hard time is not quite as great. When you are in a nursing home and the finish line is evidently in sight, Everything that you sang about in this room becomes a lot more difficult. When you're in a hospital bed, when you're facing the hardship, the reality of death, and it gets real, then resurrection hope is a whole new ballgame. And 
The fact is, this year has been a hard year for folks in our church family. Larry Newhoffen, you just sit right back there, and not very long ago, he sang with us in this room about resurrection hope. And this year, on December 14th, he, his, his faith became sight, and he passed away. And we, we grieve with Carol at his loss. John, John and Pat McKee, Grant prayed for those who have had a hard year. This morning is one year anniversary of their 34-year-old daughter, Allison. There are, there are many others. Ben Ross, Ann and Sarah, who not very long ago saw, saw their mom unexpectedly on a Sunday after church pass away. Rebecca Cabe stood at her dad's graveside this year. Ashley Fite, after caring for her dad and his, his battle with health issues, said goodbye to her father for the last time. Elaine Legner said goodbye to her mom two weeks ago. And there are, there are others. Betty Hardman, whose smile used to just radiate through this building and radiate through Heritage Health. Or what about, what about Greg Umlin th this year, who had a heart transplant surgery in January, and he's sitting there waiting, and all, all the truth that he's heard and knows becomes very, very, very real in that moment. Or what about Phil and Linda Hartzler, perhaps live streaming right now? Phil's been diagnosed with ALS, and they are they're talking about the finish line of life. They did, they did not see that coming. And all of these people I've given a heads up because I, I know that the, this grief is, is, is heavy. You see, the idea of resurrection hope is, is really, really great. But when it gets real, then what? And I, and I, and I debated whether or not to even mention these realities because I don't, I don't want to be a downer on Easter but I do want us to know that resurrection hope is not just for a holiday one hour in this room. It's for the hospital. It's for the funeral home. It's for the very worst moments of our lives when we can say, he is risen. And I have a sure and certain and steadfast hope that comes even through tears on the hardest days. My Savior lives. That's why we're turning to 2 Timothy this morning. It's kind of an odd choice for an Easter text, but in 2 Timothy, the Apostle Paul is facing the finish line of his life. He's writing this letter from jail, and in chapter 4, he says, the time of my departure is near. He knows that his days are numbered, and as death becomes more real, so too does the hope of resurrection life. In this short four-chapter letter, he repeatedly talks about the hope of resurrection. So we're going to bounce around a little bit, but we're going we're to see three truths in this letter about the gospel message. The gospel means the announcement of good news, and Paul mentions this gospel that gives us real hope. Today, yes, amen, but every day in every circumstance. The first truth of this good gospel is the declaration that Jesus defeated death. This is in chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 10, let's read together. Paul writes, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death. That's a good phrase. Who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. If you were to just remember one thing today, I would, I would suggest it be those two words in verse 10 abolished death. My kids love to play with 
this stuff called slime, or maybe it's called goop. When I was a kid, it was called gack, right? It's this, this slimy stuff. They get it at Christmas, they get it at birthdays, they get it from school, they have recipes to make it. They just love this slime. I hate it. The reason is because every carpet in our home has had slime in it. The, the ceiling of our minivan has had slime on it. Their pillowcases have had slime in it. There is slime all over the place. So I make it my aim to ban slime from our house. I've abolished slime multiple times, three, four times, and somehow it keeps coming back. And so you know what I do when I see slime? I throw it away, and I'm not even sorry. <laughs> I do that. Like, no, I, I just, I get rid of it. It keeps coming back, but that's kind of what it means to abolish something, is to end it, to destroy it, to say, out of here, it's over, no more, it is done. I'm a slime abolisher. In 1 Timothy 1.10, Paul says, Christ has abolished. He has done away with. He has thrown away. He has done everything he can to put death to an end. The message here, the declaration of the gospel, is that Jesus put death to death. This is foundational to the gospel message. It's the testimony. You see that in verse 8. It's the testimony about our Lord. Paul didn't make this up. It's the object of truth seen by eyewitnesses, passed down from generation to generation, that Christ has put death to death. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says it like this, for I delivered to you what I received. So notice that. He he didn't make it up. He received from eyewitnesses. For I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter. Then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. This is the idea that the gospel message has been handed down. It's been passed off. It's been cared for and cherished. I thought of it being like a newborn baby. We've had a lot of babies at our church. When they come to church, it's maybe pre-COVID, but they just get passed around, right? They just get cared for. The baby gets passed around. That's what's happened with the gospel from the eyewitnesses passed down and cared for from generation to generation. And core to this gospel is that Jesus is risen from the dead. It's, it's not a side point. It's, it's central to it. In chapter 2, verses 8, in verse 8, Paul says this, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. So, so get that. When he just does a shorthand version of the gospel, he says, Jesus rose from the dead, just as the scriptures foretold. That's my gospel. Now, of course, there's more than that, right? The whole book of Romans says a lot more about the gospel. It talks about the forgiveness of sins, that Christ died as a substitute for our sins. Yes and amen. But notice, In 2 Timothy, not only here, but throughout the letter, Paul barely talks about forgiveness of sins. Why? He's near the end of life. At the end of life, the the point of the gospel that he wants to emphasize is victory over death, that Christ is risen. Oftentimes in our particular stream of Christianity, we're, we're heavy on the cross and forgiveness, and we're light on the resurrection. We're Good Friday Christians and not Easter Christians. And the gospel is both. He died for our sins and he's risen to conquer death for all who believe. Christians, don't be a Good Friday only Christian. Be an Easter Christian. Sin is not our only enemy. Death is our enemy. And this text says that Christ has put death to death. That's the first promise of the gospel. The second is this. The gospel is a promise of life. The gospel is a promise of life. So in other words, the gospel is not just about what Jesus did. It's about what Jesus is going to do. See, when we read together that death is abolished, that death is destroyed, that Jesus has defeated death, you may read that and go, wait a second. We just heard stories in this room of the pain of death. So how, how do we stand here, and how does this Bible say death's defeated when it's so very real? 
How, 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 do we, how do we gather together with other Christians around the world and proclaim the victory over death, and yet, in our country alone, half a million families this year have grieved the loss of loved ones from COVID? It feels sort of contradictory. The key to understanding this is the word promise. The word promise. In the very first verse of this letter, Paul writes this. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. So here's how it works. When Jesus rose from the dead, he proved his power over death. But after he arose from the dead, he did not yet finally and fully do away with death. Instead, he gave us a promise that one day he will. So Bible scholars and theologians refer to this as the now and not yet kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is now in some respects. Christ has offered forgiveness. He's accomplished forgiveness. He's offered us life. But it's not yet finally and fully been manifest. That is yet to come. Jesus in the Bible is called the first fruits from among the dead. He's the first one, and the idea of first fruits is that there's many more fruits yet to come. It's kind of like a a text my brother sent me not long ago. Many of you know, if you're from the area, that Rivian Automotive is a big new car company that's being built in normal, right? Some of you are actually doing work there. Maybe you've applied to get a job there. You're hired to work there. The deal with Rivian is billions of dollars are being poured into this thing. I mean, Ford and Amazon, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge economic boost for our area. But kind of the underlying stubborn fact about Rivian is that they haven't made a car, right? I mean, everybody kind of knows that. They're a startup. So they, they've got all the money, and, and you go on, on their website, and it's really, really cool. Like, I will definitely take one of their SUVs. If anybody just if you have $70,000 you want to give to your pastor, put it toward that. I mean, it, it all looks great, and there, there's this promise, hey, we're coming, we're putting this money, we're building this thing, but they haven't made any cars yet. But about a month ago, my brother texted me from a stoplight, text, texting while driving, I guess, talking about that, but he, he texted me a photo of a Rivian SUV sitting at a stoplight. And he's like, they made one. I don't, I don't know where they made it, but this is, it, this, here it is. It's really going to happen. And the idea is that's kind of like the first fruits. They have the ability to make an SUV. More are yet to come. And you can actually, for a thousand bucks, put a down payment on one, so when they start rolling off the line, you can get your Rivian SUV. That's kind of like how the resurrection hope works. Christ Christ raises from the dead, and he says, I can do this. I can defeat death. I abolish death. I have the power over that. But there's more yet to come later in time. We don't understand the mystery of why God set it up that way, but we have the promise of the risen Savior Jesus Christ who says, if you are united to me, you are in the future resurrection that is yet to come. In fact, this promise is an offer. It's an invitation. Look at chapter 2, verse 11 with me. In chapter 2, 11, Paul quotes a creed or maybe some some lines from an ancient hymn that they sang together. He says, The saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The promise is right there. It's in that little word, if. That's an important word. It says, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If is a contingency. It's a qualification. It's saying, we have to respond to this. We have to unite to Jesus. We have to choose. And Jesus is saying, are are you with me or not? Have you died with me or, or not? And we know from Paul's other letters that this language is referenced to baptism. When it says, if you have died with me, that's written by a living person. So he's saying, if you have united with me in baptism, in Romans chapter 6, Paul explains this. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been united, who have been, excuse me, baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? That's what it's talking about here. 
Baptism doesn't save you, but baptism is the external proclamation that in your soul you've said, I'm with Jesus. He is my hope. He is my everything. I'm turning from my sins, and I'm walking with Jesus. And by the way, I love this little, in verse 13, I love how it says, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. So it also says, if we deny him, he will deny us. But see, there, see a difference there? It's like, look, look you deny Jesus, you don't, you don't share in the, the hope of resurrection life. But if you're faithless, if you've united him, in, you've been baptized in him, you've professed your faith in Jesus, you've turned from your sins, and you're faithless and you meander, and who here is meandered? He will remain faithful. His promises are good. That's the invitation. I ask you, have you united your life to Christ? The next two Sundays, we have baptisms here. And those two baptisms are young guys who are saying, my answer to the if is yes, I'm with Christ. I'm receiving his promise. So the gospel is not only about what happened in the past, it's also about what will happen, that all who are united to Christ share in his resurrection. There's one more truth here from the gospel, good news for us, and it's this. The gospel drives out fear. The gospel drives out fear. I'm going to say that another way. The gospel gives us courage to hold loosely to our life. We see this in chapter 2, verse 8. Again, it says, Remember Christ Jesus, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Now, think about that for a second. Why would a pastor write that to another pastor? Remember Jesus. It would be weird if Grant texted me, Hey man, remember Jesus. Right? We have probably some weird texts in our thread over the years, but that would be a weird one. Because a pastor is going to remember Jesus, right? Like, we're not going to forget who Jesus is. So why is Paul telling Timothy, remember him? It's because of suffering. In chapter 3, verse 12, it says that all who live a godly life in, in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says to Timothy, remember my persecutions. Remember my sufferings that happened in Lystra. So real quick history lesson. In the book of Acts, Acts chapter 14, Paul goes to the town of Lystra and he preaches the gospel. And you know what they do to him there? They throw rocks at him and try to kill him. And the other disciples, the text says this, they thought he was dead. Think about that. You preach the gospel and you literally get hit with rocks in the head and they think you're dead. The next day they go on to the next city and then the text says, this is Acts chapter 14. This is where it gets crazy. It says, they returned to Lystra, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So, so let's get that straight. Paul is almost killed for his faith. His friends drag him out of the city thinking he's dead. And then a few days later, what does he do? He goes back and he preaches the gospel again. Why would you do that? Resurrection hope. That's why. A few chapters later in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul says, For I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given to me, the task of testifying to the gospel of grace. Resurrection hope drives out fear of death and it makes us bold. It makes us cling loosely to our lives. Paul says in Philippians 1, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Resurrection hope takes the greatest enemy of human existence, death, transforms it into a finish line of our race of faith. That's why Paul concludes this letter to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 6, with these famous words. He writes, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have 
fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If you've received the promise of resurrection life from Jesus, death is transformed into a finish line. And if you've ever run a long race, the finish line is the best part. It is. It is the moment of rest. We don't dread the finish line in a race. We long for it. You desire it. You want it. Now this does not mean that we are callous about death or indifferent or that we're stoic about it. Death is a moment of great loss where life's greatest gifts are taken away from us. So we grieve very rightly so. Grief is the byproduct of love, right? <laughs> when, we, when we love someone, we love God's gift, grief is the byproduct of that. And in fact, Christians of all people who are called to give thanks for God's good gifts and to love one another, in, in one sense, we ought to grieve the most. <laughs> it hurts our souls when God takes his gift. But we don't grieve with despair. We grieve with hope. The lyric of a song that we sing, sing is, Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. When we've united our lives to the one who's abolished death, we really, 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 truly do not need to fear death. In this year, when the fragility of life has been on the minds of people around the globe, the people of God can take heart. Again, we're not callous, we're not indifferent, we're not reckless, but we can look at death and say, we have hope. So church, follower of Jesus, do you have this hope? Have you received the promise of Christ? Death is not beautiful. Death is not beautiful. But there is a glory when a believer approaches the finish line in faith. There is a glory. I've seen it. Many of you have seen it. When someone sees the finish line coming and they are at rest, they are at peace. When someone sees the finish line coming and they can say, as Paul writes in this letter, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced that he is able to keep until that day that which he has entrusted to me. He, he knows he's at rest. There is a glory when a believer approaches the finish line and they possess as if it's a real object, living hope. Church, I hope you have that promise. And this applies to every person here, but there are some people here who have a medical diagnosis or perhaps at an age where you are thinking more about the finish line. And I hope today the word of God has so strengthened your soul that Easter is not just an idea, it's not just a holiday of good, goodwill and tidings. Easter is living in your soul. It is driving out the fear of death. And if there's anybody here that doesn't have that hope, I encourage you to look at the promise that Jesus extends in chapter 2, verse 11. If you have died with him, you will live with him. I encourage you to repent of your sin. Call upon him. There's no other answer for immortality but the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no other hope but Jesus Christ. And be baptized into his name. It doesn't matter if this is your first Sunday ever in a church or you've been in church for 75 years. Unite your soul to Jesus Christ and receive his promise. The joy we, joy we have this morning is not just theoretical joy. It's real in the deepest, darkest moments. This is our gospel. He is risen. He's, a, he's, he's, he's abolished death. Therefore, we don't fear because Jesus has put death to death. Amen. Father, we praise you. We praise you that fear is gone and hope is sure. We praise you that there's no guilt in life, no fear in death. We praise you that you have trampled death 
abolishing it. And you have extended that promise to each of us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing praise to God.